Um, quick introduction. My name is Janelle Jakeways. Um, I am a veteran game developer. Um, coming up on basically this year, it's about 40 years working in games of various sorts. Um, I started in pencil and paper role playing back in the 70s on dungeon, writing adventures for Dungeons and Dragons, publishing my own uh, fan magazine, and that eventually led to working for Coleco as a um, first a game designer, then eventually head of the game design department. I'm going to pass it over to Becky. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca Heineman. Um, I started in the video game industry uh, in a completely different path. I was the national Atari 2600 Space Invaders champion in June of 1980. So many of you are looking like you weren't even born yet. Um, I won the Los Angeles Regionals in, at Topanga Canyon Plaza, now called Westfield, uh, Westfield Topanga, uh, but back then it was called Topanga Canyon Plaza. Um, after beating out about 10,000 other players, oh no, 40,000 other players, yes, 40,000 players, um, I then went on to the Nationals, which was held in November in 1980 in New York City, where I then won against the other champions of all the other regionals and became the national champion. Had my 15 minutes oh, of fame. Um, you know, appeared in all sorts of stuff, which was impromptly forgotten when the video game crash happened. Uh, but um, I had uh, no money whatsoever. So I then uh, took the problem of the dark arts and learned reverse engineering. And at that point, I learned how to program the Atari 2600 and started making my own games, which then had me snatched up by the Avalon Hill Game Company, where I then started doing Atari 2600 games for them. And that's what started my career. <laughs> so do you want to talk more about the, um, your breaking in? Sure. Well, the way I broke into the industry was after winning the tournament. I then went ahead and started writing articles for Electronic Games Magazine on how to beat certain video games. I was the, uh, I wrote, initially wrote these two books, How to Beat the Video Games and How to Beat the Home Video Games, with a gentleman by the name of Tom Hirschfeld, because back then I just wrote all the notes and how to beat the games, and he actually turned it into a book. Um, after that, um, I then notified the, my uh, editor, uh, Arnie Katz, at the Electronic Games Magazine that, uh, yeah, I happen to have these little cartridges that I made. And he went, you made them? How? And I explained it, and he goes, speak English. Um, so shortly thereafter, he then told me about a company, Avalon Hill, that was looking for programmers who anybody who could program an Atari 2600 and was still alive. Um, that was basically my resume. Um, and with that, moved to Taos, Maryland, and was there for a little under a year working on those games. After that, got recruited to HBO to work on a play cable system, where, here it is, I'm 17 years old, it just hadn't even turned 18 yet, and here it is, I'm designing hardware and stuff for uh, HBO, when um, I just wanted to go home, went back to Southern California, and ended up at uh, place called Boom Corporation through a friend in uh, the pirate community who happened to say, hey, this is a company that works here. You know, while we're busy pirating at night, we can actually write games for a living during the day. <laughs> so I went to work there, and about less than a year later, we were all unceremoniously fired because the owner of Boom Corporation, a guy named Mike Boone, decided instead of selling video games, he wanted to sell, get this, whiteboards at swap meets. <laughs> Although, to Mike's credit, he turned it into a whiteboard enterprise, which then started the whiteboard industry, and he's sitting on a big, giant pile of money. <laughs> so, um, my background's different from Becky's. I actually, um, no, let me pause this again. Um, I got started in pencil and paper role playing games. Um, I had no computer training of any kind. I didn't even really touch a computer till, till I was after, out of college a few years. Um, I had an art degree, um, undergraduate, fine art, um, but I got involved in Dungeons and Dragons when I was in college. And now, it seems like a pervasive part of our culture today. I mean, every game is almost, every, every, almost every game now is based on Dungeons and Dragons. But in 1975, to um, a young college sophomore, wow, this was like discovering the world to me. And my brother and I had always gamed growing up. 
um, younger brother and I. So we, but we made our own game worlds, usually beginning with blocks, wooden blocks. My, I owe my grandparents a great deal. Uh, my career owes my grandparents a great deal for some maple wooden blocks they gave us as kids. But I just, my brother called me up. I was working at the college radio station as an announcer, and he started reading me this review of this game in a magazine called The Space Gamer that had just been sent to him. Well, this game happened to be Dungeons and Dragons. And he read these, re these reviews to me, and it was like, you go through your life and you look back and you realize there are points in your life where your life completely took a different direction. It may not have seemed like it at the time, but this was one of those times. When he read those reviews to me, my life went off in a different direction because of that. Um, I got involved in it as a hobby. And because I was a hobby, it was, it, the one seemed to be publishing material for it. I started publishing my own fan magazine called The Dungeoneer. Several issues later, it was distributed internationally. I sold it. And I ended up, I sold it because I needed to have the time to finish my art degree and finish college. So I sold it to a man um, who published two more issues, then took it to another, group, another publisher. And after I graduated from college, to shorten the story, I ended up working for that publisher and working on my own magazine again as a contributor instead of the editor and publisher. That lasted for a year. I wrote some game adventures called Dark Tower and uh, Caverns of Thracia for Dungeons and Dragons. To give you a clue, I was 22 years old at the time. I had never, these were my first prof um, real professional publications. Those two game adventures, 30, what are we, 37 years later, 1979, Forever. are still in print. One of them, both of them are sometimes considered the best game adventures for Dungeons and Dragons ever written. 22 year old kid, I called down the lightning twice and I'm amazed, I, I'm still trying to figure out how I did that. So I worked for them for a year, decided that working for minimum wage doing game adventures for this publisher was, um, I could probably do better. So I went and worked for minimum wage for myself for a year, um, being a freelance artist and designer, and bumped into a young man, another young man at a game convention, not unlike this, but for role-playing games. And we made friends, um, and then he invited me, a couple of weeks later he called me up and said, hey, I'm at Coleco. They're looking for another person to come in and help them design a game adventure, a game for a product they're trying to market. Are you available? And I thought about it, said, sure. I was going broke slowly then. Um, so I took the, uh, I went out, interviewed with them, met um, Eric Bromley, who most people know as being the father of ColecoVision, uh, one of the fathers of ColecoVision, and signed on. I worked with Mike there for about, um, three months together, and then Coleco decided to make us both offers as jobs. I accepted, took a full-time job as a game designer. Mike decided that he was gonna go back home to Arizona because he had goals of being a uh, science, fiction, uh, science fiction and fantasy author. Just a, I'm gonna pass it back to Becky because this was- You should was, get to say the last name of that guy. I'm gonna say the name. <laughs> the author's name was Michael A. Stackpole. He went on to become a New York Times best-selling um, fantasy role-playing game designer, and, or um, fantasy artist, or author, 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 fantasy author, still writing today, still publishing today. He's got over 35, 40 books to his credit now. Um, but that was how I broke in to Coleco, but it's not the story of ColecoVision yet. It's just how we got into Coleco working on electronic toys. And that toy they brought us in to work on, um, it never went anywhere. It was using two hot new technologies for 1980. Um, scan, um, barcode scanning and voice simulation chips. And we were making a role playing game to try and use a barcode, a car, a barcode reader that read cards that fed through it and output speech phonemes. Hot technology for 1980. We're all too hit. <laughs> but that's well before ColecoVision. I'm going to pass it back to Becky so she can tell the next phase of the, her story. Oh, about the uh, us getting all unceremoniously canned and going like, hey, 
I'm unemployed again. That's Mike Sackpole, by the way, on the, uh, coming over the desk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the four of us that were at uh, Boone that decided to stick together and form a company were, um, we said, well, um, we could do better. And we went ahead and formed a company called Interplay. And from that, we basically starved for a couple of years, but uh, I then wrote Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, Borrow Time, Task Times in Tone Town, um, all these really popular games that really started putting Interplay on the map. And then eventually it culminated in me um, doing a lot of the technology that ended up being in, in Bard's Tale and uh, Wasteland. And then of course I did start doing all the ports of every game, like our racing destruction set for the Tori um, 800. Um, and then there was, then came the big one where I did at the, yep. Yeah. So oh, that's the, when I was at Boone, that's what I was doing. I was taking Atari 2600 cartridges, uh, Chuck Norris Super Kicks and uh, Robin Hood and converting them to the VIC-20 and the, eventually the Commodore 64. In fact, uh, we were, you know, working with Zonix, i.e. Ktel Records, was so bad because they just were so hard to work with, we kind of had a running joke at Boone that if you were really bad, we're gonna make you work on a Zonix game. I did three of them. <laughs> I'm a very bad person. Oh, that's your game. I know, I'm trying to catch you up over to Interplay. Where are you, where you, the slide deck was made a few years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at Interplay, um, I, the, the games I'm most known for was when I started doing a lot of these ports, such as like Neuromancer, uh, World Karate Championship for Epics. Um, so you did some games for California games. Um, but then I found this new machine that Apple came up with called the Cortland, which was eventually renamed the Apple II GS. And I took a game of mine called Task Times in Tone Town and converted it literally in about three weeks to the Apple II GS. Brand new machine, new graphics, new sound. And uh, it became the very first game shipped on the II GS. Ironically, I'm also the person who wrote the last game on the II GS called Out of This World. Um, but with that, I took Bard's Tale 1 and 2, converted them to the 2GS, totally rewrote them, totally redid them, new graphics, sound, stuff, and everybody's saying, like, that's Bard's Tale. Well, at Interplay, there was a falling out between Michael Cranford, the original creator of the Bard's Tale series, and Interplay, and with that, there was going to be no Bard's Tale 3. And that's when I said, well, I want to do Bard's Tale 3. So I created a scenario and uh, worked with, ironically, um, Michael Stackpole um, to help me with old story writing. And uh, yeah, that's the uh, scenes from Borrowed Time. Yeah, that's Mind Shadow. Trying to catch up to Bard's Tale. Mm -hmm. But um, so then spent about a year uh, working on creating Bard's Tale 3. And I did the Apple II, C64, PC, and 2GS versions all simultaneously. And when the game shipped, it was like, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, what an amazing, and it won several awards, including it got enshrined at the Art of the Video Game Museum exhibit at the Smithsonian. So I was actually really impressed with that. But all these games I've been churning out is that, uh, to put things in perspective, I self-taught how to com program a computer game. I never went to college. In fact, I didn't even finish high school. I just simply got my computer, started learning. Anytime I found an ob obstruction, I went to bulletin boards or read the book and uh, figured out how to continue on. So when I hear people these days saying, well, I can't afford college. Well, that didn't stop me. That shouldn't stop you either. I mean, granted, these days a college degree, yeah, probably helps a lot. But it's not an insurmountable wall. I mean, today, these days, I'm working on full 3D engines, shaders, designing chips. Um, was work, one of my parts of my career is I worked at Sony for a year, uh, working on the design of what we call Project Orbis, which we now know as the PlayStation 4. So, and of course, I was even at the Microsoft Advanced Technology Group for two and a half years, where I was working on uh, Project Durango, which was now we know the Xbox One. So I'm actually one of the few people who know the dark, dirty secrets of both platforms. <laughs> Trust me, they're dark and dirty. <laughs> Your turn? My turn. 
talk about Coleco. Let us hear the dark and spooky. Okay. <laughs> to give you an idea, I spent five years, five and a half years at Coleco. Um, I was there for the full product art of the tabletop arcades, the ColecoVision, and the Atom. So I was involved in all of those product lines and initially beginning as a game designer in the what we call the advanced research and development part, department. Um, started out there in 1980 as a contractor, became full time in February of 1981. And not long after that, there was a political battle inside Coleco and my department lost. And we lost all the engineers associated with the department. They went over to the engineering department. And I think we were left with um, my boss, Eric Bromley, um, his secretary, me, my manager, who was another designer, and um, a tech writer. And this was, this was what was left of our department. And we got sent off to live in exile, basically, in, an, in another part of the basement in Coleco. But during this time, they started coming up with some ideas for other products. And in one of these was tabletop electronics. It's tabletop, not tabletop electronics, but tabletop arcade games based on popular arcades, which were really just starting to become very popular in the United States. And the first one was Galaxians, and it came in from the outside, almost complete. We made a couple of tweaks to it, um, did some testing on it. In fact, you can see the pictures here. Um, I'm going to pause this one for a moment. Yeah, which one was the one you drew the uh, person? Um, but we worked on these for a while. I did the donkey tongue, but I was going to say, we worked on these for a bit. Here, if you want to play the game with it. Um, we worked on the titles. We started out doing Donkey Kong, or do, a um, tabletop version of Galaxians. The next one we started working on was a tabletop version of Pac-Man. We didn't have it for the, a video game license. We had it for this tabletop. And we, one of my coworkers and I, one of the other junior, other engineers, we played the living daylights out of Pac-Man until when I went home at night just to, and laid in bed reading, I could see things moving in between the lines of the text. <laughs> I was and it was really disturbing. Um, but what we ended up doing was is we had to we had to interpret the screen of Pac-Man onto a vacuum fluorescent display tube. And vacuum fluorescent display tube is essentially in some ways is the predecessor to the L C D screen. Um, it was Print material printed on a circuit board in a vacuum tube that it functioned like a vacuum tube. When you got it excited with electrons crossing through it, um, it glowed. And we had it glowed usually either blue or pink. And so we used overlays, plastic overlays on the screen to change that into red and yellow or some other colors to intent to get the, the different colors we used in the screen. And my first job on Batman was to redesign the screen so it would function with several different games. And so it would actually be Pac-Man. Um, I also tweaked the shape of the character that's on the screen from the original so it looked more like um, people were experiencing Pac-Man in the USA. That was my first tabletop. The next one was Donkey Kong. The Donkey Kong, and you can see the screen here in the center, um, Jay Belsky and I played the Living Daylights out of the Donkey Kong tabletop they sent us. They sent us the arcade games to play. That's all we ever got was the arcade game. No design specs, no timing specs, no graphics, just the arcade game. So we analyzed it. And then I sat down and drew a vacuum fluorescent layout, which means this is a circuit board layout, actually. It's just done with graphics. Drew it up full size, placed all the characters, and then it, the final art was printed for my art, art that I did for it. I'm still impressed by that. You know, it's, that was 1982. I'm still impressed with myself by that. We weren't involved with any of the cabinets or anything, just the play of the game. And we ended up doing two of the three levels that I think are in Donkey Kong, from what I remember. And the idea was is you even had to try and fake in animation so that as the Mario character moved across the screen, it looked like he was walking because his feet were changing position right, from, from frame to frame. 
So we did several of those, and then by that, by the time we were working on Donkey Kong, we were already starting to ramp up um, into the production of a video game console. Something to understand about Coleco as a toy company was that they were never really out front. They were never first in everything. They always looked at the market and they said, what's popular, what's selling? And then they thought, what can we do better and cheaper? Better, actually it was usually, what can we do cheaper and maybe better? And so they looked at, they looked at what, well, my, my friend Jay and another engineer, Bob Hoskins, worked together and they came up with a spec, for, uh, uh, an equipment spec that would produce an, literally a console off, with off-the-shelf parts. Um, they used a T, the TI um, color graphics chip that was popular in the TI computer, and they used a Z80 processor, which was a very popu fairly popular 8-bit processor at the time, oh, yeah. but probably CPM. also meant it was fairly cheap. Mm -hmm. And then they, RAM was starting to slowly starting to come down in price so that that was affordable to have some online RAM. So that became the components for the ColecoVision. And of course they made it look like, the design department made it look like temporary electronics, so it was black and sleek and it buttons. Um, but we were really, we weren't, that was not our job. Our job was to make the game content. And we started with first by coming up with Again, we, Jay and I went through and played the living daylights out of pack, or out of um, Donkey Kong, and we wrote the first design spec that, for, based on the analysis of Donkey Kong that could be turned into a video game. And we programmed that game in-house. We had a couple of programmers working on-house. A uh, programmer by the name of Zach Smith, Zachary Smith, um, was the lead engineer. He also wrote the operating system for Coleco, for the ColecoVision. Yeah, which is a ripoff, Prodos. Oh, hush. <laughs> <laughs> Prodos for the Apple II, to be specific. Zach was amazing. I mean, he was, uh, put it, to give you an idea of how impressive he was to some of us at the office, two of us named our first children after him. <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> That's only, we just named it after him. There's no other, nothing else in plot. Um, so we, we, were, we worked on the first console, the first game in-house, but we needed, we knew the launch, we needed just a whole bunch of titles. And the ColecoVision box, when it came out, was proposed, there was just all sorts of video game titles on the outside of the box. Some of them are arcades, some of them were original, some of them were based on licensed products like the Smurfs that Coleco was already working with. And the idea was, is this the promise of things to come? Well, a lot of those were false promises. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize in this day of, oh, we take a screenshot and we reduce it down and put it on our packaging, there were no video graphics to screenshot at that point of the packaging. So we came, my art department, which I had built um, up from scratch, no one had ever worked in um, computer graphics before other than making slides with slide making machines. Yeah, you were drawing your, you were actually drawing with felt tip markers on graph paper. We were drawing with felt tip, we, every piece of art on, on the ColecoVision was drawn on graph paper with Marvy markers, watercolor markers. Every single frame, and that would be the way it was for the next three years, roughly. Hey, I did that with all my games back yeah. then too, graph paper, just black, except my kids just black, white, black, that's all I had. Well, that's, they all ended up technically being black, but they ended up being data tables. Mm -hmm. um, so we, the artists in my group, and by this time I had six or seven artists who had all come out of different walks of life. A couple were recent graduates of art schools. One was a house painter um, who had lived in the same town, little town in Connecticut that I did at the time. A um, couple we brought up out of New York, and not one was an an, couple. One was an animator who had worked on Raggedy Ann and Andy previously, and he was our animator. He did our all our animations for all of Coleco, and he was a character. Um, that's another story. <laughs> so we produced the we we went through my art team, and they went through, and we bet we did best guesses on what these games would look like on ColecoVision, and drew them on the, with markers on the on the graph paper. And then the next step was to hand it off to our art department. When I mean art department, I mean packaging, marketing and packaging. 
And they turned, handed it off to an outside ad agency who took these screens and made them with cut paper, colored cut paper, which was a very, which was a standard practice for advertising back then, but you used just flat cuts of color. Then it ended up looking like these, um, the computer screens here. So a lot of the games on that first package never were real and never became real. Through the course of the year then, we worked with several outside firms to produce, produce the first games that came out in ColecoVision. Um, the Donkey Kong, the Smurfs, which we did in-house, um, Ladybug, Mousetrap. Um, I think what Zaxxon was that year, because we were also doing the Zaxxon tabletop. Um, we were cranking out, one game took nine months to produce. So but we were already in production making games by, not, by March of um, 1982 with the intent that, no, we were probably, no, we were in production in February because we had to be able to ship by November. So we, had, we were cranking out all these games in parallel. There were four or five designers, six or seven artists, a handful of computer programmers inside, and even more, at least four or five shops outside programming our Coleco games for us. And we were managing it all inter internally. Each one of the designers involved was usually managing every version of a game. So if we did Donkey Kong, I was the in charge of the Donkey Kong project. I was also in charge of the Donkey Kong I'm in um, ColecoVision, the tabletop, the Atari, and the Intellivision. Those are all being done in parallel. For what is it? Okay. Um, so we were we were running not just the Coleco products at, the, at that time. We were running products on two other game systems, and people would complain about why isn't your game as good on the Intellivision as it is on. The Atari, or on the on the Coleco, or why is it so ugly on the um, the Atari? Not really understanding that part of the reason we chose the ColecoVision's part was to simulate arcade games, and that the other arcade games it was um, we were forcing them to create. You could create good games on those systems, but we were forcing them to act as if they were um, could do the arcades and. Okay, we have problems here. Yeah. It's all the power supply. It says it's on, but it's okay. not working. Oh. So, um, from at Coleco, we were doing these multiple games, and then by, we were, and we weren't even focused on the hardware. The hardware was going along on its own track. We just made the games, um, complained about the, the components, the hard to use controllers that were as big as building bricks, and, um, working on just getting everything working, playing, feeling right on the, on the system. And somewhere in there, I seem to remember in the next year, we were also working on the advanced ones. But I'm going to let Becky go because my mouth's running down. <laughs> oh, yes, talking about projects from hell. I could either talk about doom or out of this world. <laughs> uh, don't let me ask the audience, would you prefer me to talk about doom for the 3DO or out of this world for the SNES? Doom. 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 Doom, okay. <laughs> Doom is nicknamed a journey through hell. I mean, because many of you here know what Doom is. Now, when I'm not talking about the new version of Doom that was just released this year, uh, but from Bethesda. I'm talking about the version of the game that was done in 1994 by id Software. Well, in 1996, uh, Trip Hawkins created a company called 3DO, and his whole idea was to be the VHS of video games. As we now know in history, that ended up more like the Betamax of the video games. Um, but nevertheless, people were pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars into doing 3DO games. Of course, nearly everybody lost money. Well, in comes this company called Art Data Interactive. And they had this impression that if they just simply raised the money to buy the rights to the game Doom, it would put their game company on the map. That actually wasn't too far from the truth, except these people had no idea what it took to make a video game at all. They literally believed that if I just took the PC version of the game, 
put it into a 3DO, it would just run. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. The game development is a very tricky, very difficult, very time consuming, and in many cases a very expensive endeavor. And these people did not understand that. Now, to preface this, I was doing eight different 3DO games. I did um, Wolfenstein 3D, um, uh, worked on Siberia, Battle Chess, uh, Kingdom of the Far Reaches, Shadow In, Casper, The Friendly Ghost. Um, there's probably some others that I forgot. I just worked so many games, it's actually a blur these days. But the, when I did Wolfenstein 3D for the 3DO, it was like one of the best versions of Wolfenstein 3D ever made. So 3DO came to me and said, hey, there's this company that wants to do Doom. Everybody wants Doom on 3DO, but this company, our data, is having trouble with developers. So I said, sure, I mean, I know it's software's code like the back of my hand. In fact, I did have a small, very small hand in Doom. So I went ahead and said, sure. So I went ahead and contacted our data, you know, after 3DO made the introductions. They told me they had the game 90% complete. They told me that all I needed to do was just finish the game, add a few weapons, ship it. I said, okay, 90% complete, add a few weapons, ship it. Yeah, I can do that in about 10, 12 weeks. Here's my bid. So we agreed upon a contract, agreed upon a price, and then I said, give me that code. A week goes by. And I said, where's the code? And I ended up having an employee at our data tell me in a panic in one of those little back you know, he met me at a coffee shop and we, you know, he was like, don't tell anybody I told you this, but, and that's when my face went white as a ghost because he told me they had nothing. There was no game, no nothing. They had a copy of the PC version and the owner thought all I had to do was just, and I'm not kidding, he thought that if he just drew a picture of a new weapon had an artist make it look really pretty as a JPEG. If I took that picture, copied it into the Doom folder, not only would it show up as a new weapon, but it would have all the effects and everything in there. That's all you had to do. I'm like, what have I done? So I, I told 3DO, um, I'm out, I'm done. I, I'm not doing this. And they begged and pleaded with me. And I said, you know what? Call my friends, I did. They sent me a copy of the source code to the Jaguar version of Doom, which they just completed. And I told 3DO, I'm just gonna port that. No bells, no whistles, no nothing. I'll deliver it to you only because I'm doing it as a friend and 3DO is literally begging. So I locked myself in a room, programmed day and night, recoding that game as best as I could. So at 10 weeks later, um, I had Doom running on the 3DO. Now, there's a, a tenant in video game programming, in fact, most tech, is fast, cheap, good. Pick two. So they wanted fast and cheap, but I can certainly tell you it wasn't good. <laughs> well, halfway through the development, I realized that the music was I had to port the music driver from uh, Sega uh, Jaguar, I'm oh, sorry, the, the Atari Jaguar, that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, there was no way I could make my deadline and port the music. Well, it turns out the only saving grace um, our data had was that their CEO happened to be, have his own little rock band that he does on the side or something like that. Maybe that's his real job, I don't know. So I said, here is a cassette tape that I played of every single song in Doom. Play that with your rock band. Give me the MP3s, and I'll just drop that in a 3DO, because then I don't have to write a music driver. I'm just playing the CD. So, a few weeks later, he gives me the CD with all the tracks on it, and that is the soundtrack that ends up in Doom, which is why, despite the fact that Doom for the 3DO is the slowest, worst version of Doom out there, it has the most kick and rock soundtrack ever. <laughs> Um, but after finishing up the game and sending it off to uh, 3DO and our data, I get yelled at by our data, saying, where's all the new weapons? Where's all the new levels? Where's all this? And I'm saying, you tip, check your writing for me, add an extra zero to it, and also give me 12 more months, we'll talk. And you say, arr, arr, arr. so 
unbeknownst to me at the time, now I have the benefit of, woo, hindsight. Uh, turns out that what these guys did was they thought, hey, let's raise money. What we will do is we will press 200,000 copies of Doom for the 3DO. And then they will go ahead and sell them in the stores, and since it's Doom, it'll sell itself, and they'll make millions of dollars, and they can use that to do a, another version of Doom or something else. Except there was one little problem they overlooked. At the date that they pressed these CDs, there was only 250,000 3DOs ever sold. They did an ET where they sold, they pressed far more copies than even the most optimistic projections of sales could do. So of course, they had warehouses filled with unsold Doom for the 3DO. And they then came back and said, you know, they yelled at it, saying, I'm going to sue you because we paid all this money to get the Doom license, and why didn't the game sell? And they're like, because A, the port sucked, B, it's the 3DO, with only 250,000 units out there, you'd be lucky if you sold 10,000 copies, and that's even with a hit title. Um, math. I mean, have you guys learned math? <laughs> Um, so, of course, it didn't take very long for Art Data Interactive to disappear, and I just said, ugh, and I just disappeared for a couple of weeks to recover from that ordeal, and at the same time, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be both, you know, lambasted and appraised for, you got Doom working on a 3DO? Awesome! They play the game, I hate you! <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. My turn. <laughs> So, we've, the first year of uh, 1982, Coleco shipped the ColecoVision. It was, I'm trying to remember, it was like a $275 console in 1982 terms, which is comparable to some of the high-end systems today. Coleco, we discovered, ha was a real class act about providing people who worked on their products with samples of the work. The answer is is we had to buy them at minimal discount from the company. So my first ColecoVision I ended up buying from the company store at near full price. Um, and I could really, I couldn't even afford any cartridges. Um, we weren't making a lot of money. We even by the the, the day, we weren't making very much money. Um, I think my salary at that time was like $20,000 a year. And I was the head of the... You were paid that much? I quit it. <laughs> I worked in Interplay. I got less than that. <laughs> I had to wait till id to get real money. <laughs> um, so we worked on... We, we shipped the first title. Coleco didn't feel like giving the designers any samples of their own work. And we started ramping into um, the next season. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, there was a kind of a lot of drama earlier this year, earlier this year, around the ColecoVision Chameleon, <laughs> which debuted at a toy fair basically is a plastic shell of a Jaguar of a Jaguar but with essentially what was it a Nintendo Super Nintendo inside it oh yeah they tried to say it was a custom machine but as soon as I saw the photos I'm like get oh no, no okay no. <laughs> so but to let you know that there's a there's a history with Coleco products being demonstrated without the real content inside the box Toy Fair 1982 we worked through Christmas in 1981, going into 1982, to get the first Coleco prototype working. Inside, or underneath the box, the console, shown at Toy Fair with the ColecoVision on top of it, where people really weren't allowed to touch it because there would always be a docent there to handle their questions, underneath that, there was an Apple II computer driving the, the parts up inside the ColecoVision. Yeah, it was an Apple II um, Plus with a special card built into it that they designed. It has the video chipset for the ColecoVision. So they were using the Apple II to actually play the game. The, the graphics were rendered with what was supposed to be ColecoVision hardware. So the visuals were pretty much ColecoVision 
visuals. It was driving the TI chip. That's what uh, mattered. Yeah, but the CPU was a 6502, not the Z80 that they were using. <laughs> so that was that was kind of the say. Cole the Coleco has a history of smoke and mirrors. The ColecoVision, and then even later the, the later hardware. Well, I remember at Microsoft we had a smoke and mirrors time where the Xbox 360 was being early debuted, and the Xbox 360 was our first because after we did the original Xbox, now we call it Classic, um, which is literally a PC in a box. They wanted to use a brand new architecture, so they had this AMD graphics chip, and it turned out that they weren't going to be able to have the hardware in time, so they had to do trade shows. So they used, and this is the truth, a Macintosh G5 tower, big <laughs> Mac G5. They reprogrammed it so they would have the Xbox operating system literally converted from the old Xbox to this machine. And then they had a video card in there which simulated the video hardware for the Xbox 360. But when you went to the trade show, you had the Xbox controller and it went behind the table where you couldn't see a Mac sitting there, <laughs> which let's think that sink in. Microsoft is showing off a game platform where there's a Mac under the table. <laughs> Stories. <laughs> we know where all the bodies are buried. So when you're walking out the hall left there, don't don't smell it there too long. Don't that. <laughs> so the second season of, of Coleco, um, we had the we had the hardware, we had a lot of promise of new cartridges for the coming year. And we started working on those. Um, the big thing for the next year was going to be the super action sports controllers which I will be right up front about. I worked on them. I was, one of the, I was basically the product lead, the, the, the game designer assigned to them, even though I was department head at the, or design department manager at the same time. I really hated those, car, those, those controllers. They were like... They looked like a big sword hilt, didn't they? They looked like a big sword hilt. They were, I mean, I have large hands. And, you know, this thing is like this around my hand. And it's got these buttons here, like a clarinet or a saxophone, which surprisingly, Eric Bromley, the head of the department who had proposed this controller, was a clarinetist. He was a graduate of the Juilliard School of Music. For him, playing an instrument like this was natural. For me, this was like, um, which finger do I move? And let's factor in the fact you have the joystick on the top that if you push forward, then you're shoving the controller right in your fingers. And it was a long travel joystick. <laughs> I mean, it had, a, it had a throw on it, something like a shaft on it, something like that. So you were throwing the stick and it moved, you know, it wasn't a twitch, twitch, twitch. It was a orrrrrr. You moved it over that way. And then it went from being, the Coleco is actually a four button controller, meaning that to get diagonal movement, you had to press two corner buttons. So you could go cardinal movements, or to get um, diagonals, you've got two of the cardinal buttons in the same direction. Well, on the Super Action controller, it was designed to have a live rubber keypad underneath the, um, the joystick and eight buttons. So it, made, it actually having more buttons made it more difficult to hit those angles. And you would get a lot, a lot of false reads. And then we brought, we brought back something that had been um, taken out of the original ColecoVision controller. If you remember the original ColecoVision controller, I'm gonna use Becky's mouth, phone here. It was a big square brick. You had a disc shaped um, controller up here. You had a key, telephone keypads worth the keyboard down here. Um, and then down here, there was a space. Well, originally in that space, there was supposed to be a spinner, a spinner control, which was, this was Eric Bromley's idea that the most fun you could have would be holding the controller, this giant controller in your hand, and whacking it like this. <laughs> to add speed or something to like a sports player. Well, it got cost reduced out, thank goodness. 
but it came back in the super action controller. So we have the sword hilt with the four rainbow colored buttons down your hand. It was already big on my hand, and then it came with something to make it even work even bigger. It had a little slide piece that came over the back that made it fit even bigger hands. Bigger than mine. Bigger than my, I can palm a basketball hands. <laughs> so we've got the controller, and then on the back now, you've got the spinner. So you can do this, you can do this, and... I'll see you in the emergency room. I'll see you in the emergency room. <laughs> So, but we ended up designing that, um, and we ended up doing two sport, three, let me see, we did boxing, we did football, baseball, and boxing, Rocky Boxing, where we spent probably half our graphics budget on the cartridge on a single frame picture take of two boxers fighting, because it was, a, it was completely custom art but we needed it in there for the license, which was something we would get into even more later when you would talk, like, um, you go back and say, talk about the Smurfs game. Well, Smurfs are blue, but to the people at Payo, they're a particular shade of blue, a very specific shade of Pantone blue. So when we did the Smurfs on the TI graphics chip, we had a choice of three colors of blue. You had this blue, you had a light blue, a medium blue, and a dark blue. I think it was that. Well, no, but none excuse of me, that we, got, we had blue. two <laughs> shades of blue because we had three shades of red. So we had two shades of blue, and it was basically come down to you can have this blue, or you can have that blue. And they eventually grumbled and accepted this blue. Come back to the boxing, to the controller. So we eventually did ship that controller. Um, the sports games were a nightmare. Um, they were programmed literally by, they were one of the, some of the most complex programs we designed, and they were programmed by one guy at his studio, in, in his studio in Texas. Um, and as far as I know, they're as buggy as hell. But we shipped them. But they weren't the worst thing we shipped. <laughs> um, Gonna hop a little bit around. Um, what have we got? Oh, it's time. So, so I'm gonna tell one quick story. There is one. There is one piece of software we shipped that was a total piece of dreck, and it was the game called Victory. It was an arcade title. One of the games, the senior game designers on my team supervised the, the going through. He did the the, the docs. He ran it through. We proved it. It passed um, our test, internal testing and bug testing. It went off to manufacturing on EEPROMs. Um, and that went over to, the, to um, the Far East where they manufactured it. I don't the story, go ahead. It came back in. Somewhere between when it left our offices and the manufacturer, the EEPROMs got corrupted. And when the cartridges came back, they had the corrupted game ROMs in them. The thing was is they still sort of kind of played, but they were not the game we made. They were broken. Marketing, we were near the end of the marketing cycle on ColecoVision at that point. We were already in the video game crash phase. And they just said, yeah, ship it. <laughs> and I think my designer who in charge with that quit, quit two months later. <laughs> So I guess at this point, we're going to wind up real fast and say, questions from the audience. Uh oh, we got one back there. What's your question? Hi. Um, I guess my question is mostly for you. I, I, I was a big fan. We had an Apple II when I was pretty young in the late 70s. And Excellent choice. I grew up playing those, the graphic adventure games, the Sierra, and I, and I read that you did Tracer Sanction and yep. World of Time, and uh, we had those in our library somewhere. And um, I was just curious about. Um, some of your, you know, impressions or stories of writing those games back in the day when those were actually viable. <laughs> 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 well, actually, it's like they're making a comeback. I mean, right now there's a contest going on in which people can write interactive fiction and they're being judged. I just read about it on Slashdot just yesterday. So I'm thinking, like, maybe we should get in on that action. Uh, 
Inkle, but, the, the company Inkle is doing some amazing stuff with interactive fiction on Android and mm -hmm. mobile platforms. Yeah. Well, essentially, it was back then, I was really a fan of the Sierra Online graphic adventure games, Mission Asteroid, uh, Wizard and the Princess, etc. And being the bitch that I was, I always thought I could do better. And it didn't take me long to write a graphics rendering engine that did drawing like they did in Wizard and the Princess that ran like three times faster. And it was when I had my meeting with Brian Fargo over at Boone, and he showed me a game he did called Demon's Forge, which was a graphic adventure. And I said to him, hey, why don't I substitute the rendering engine you're using with mine? And upon doing so, two things. One is it made the graphics run three times faster than Wizard and the Princess. And number two, I found out whoever he hired to draw his original engine was uh, ripping him off because he intentionally, because I reverse engineered the code, and I said, wait a minute, there's a delay loop in here. Why is this delay loop in here? It's intentionally a delay loop to slow down the rendering. And then he said, oh yeah, the guy said if I paid him $5,000, he has a way to speed up the graphics. <laughs> and I'm like, here's how you do it, jump. Here, done. It's like, ah, and of course, he's never gonna work with that guy again, but, um, I went ahead and created a, instead of the techniques that Wizard and Princess was doing, I created a interpreted language, um, all sorts of codec text compression stuff, which is how uh, Mind Shadow and Tracer Sanction were able to fit as big a game as they were on just a disc and a half. Um, but since then, I then went ahead on borrowed time, I thought, again, I could do better. And then that's why I created a mouse interface, because I predated the Sierra games, like Day of the Tentacle, because they're famous because you could click anywhere. Borrowed time did that. And so it did that. You could click on anything, but still, it's hard. It was a text adventure game. And then I recreated it again even more, uh, more nicer for Pastimes in Tone Town. But it really was, came from my love of uh, the Sierra Online games. Next question? I am so sorry, that is time. Okay, we're time. All right. We will hang around outside then, if people want to talk some more.